Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Today, uh, thanks to a Kayfabe lieutenant, West Coast Dave, sent us a uh, issue of Comics Journal where the Dark Prince of Outlaw Comics interviews Rob Liefeld right as Heroes Reborn goes away, and he gets uh, he's not an image any longer. We'll, we'll put it that way. Uh, but first, we do want to let you guys know that we are a daily YouTube channel uh, with more than 1,600 videos at your disposal. Uh, we may have talked about your favorite comics, so hit the magnifying glass on the front page of the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give uh, the channel a search for your favorite titles and check out those videos. Uh, we are in part subsidized by the Patreon and the King Kayfabers on our Patreon. For one, they're hanging out with us in the live stream uh, chat room right as of this moment, but they get access to all the videos before anybody else else mitigates the kayfabe effect this issue of comics journal saw a couple of them on ebay right now uh it's uh issue number 196 the king kayfabers are snapping them all up uh and you and you you missed out become a king kayfaber support the channel we are on the road to 100,000 subscribers for the cartoonist kayfabe channel we've been at this for about five years it's time get us to uh get us to 100,000 let us do a little victory lap video showing off that little trophy that all the other youtube channels uh, have in their background uh, so that we can uh, prosper and keep this keep this thing rocking. Without further ado, Jimmy, uh, Hart D. Fisher from Boneyard Press did a comic called Kill Image. The Comics Journal is nothing if not a little humorous, <laughs> and it says that they paid him to to you know go go do this uh, Rob Rob Liefeld interview. And you just imagine like a, like a big old bearded biker guy and a little Christian like son of a deacon, kind of a you know Peckerwood like you know. O O C kind of character, uh, that that's a fun that's a funny tandem, and uh, we can. You know. It's an amazing interview too, and and I somehow this had gone past me. I had no right. idea Hart Fisher did this interview, and it's substantial. It's uh, I don't know twenty pages or something, pretty in depth, covers a lot of territory, and it's a little bit of a raw Rob Liefeld. Yeah, yeah. You you never you never you never seen him like this, man. You never seen this kind of candid, and it's it's uh, it's one of those things, man, that. Uh, He's he's in a vulnerable position. Like his life has completely changed, uh, 360 compared to where it was probably 365 days before this. So there's a shell shock uh, that is uh, involved in here, man. There's there's lawsuits and stuff. And uh, in our Wizard Magazine coverage, we just we just covered this material in the like issue say 60 to 63, where one Mark Silvestri disappears, uh, Maximum Press is starting to get a lot of hype, and then a couple issues later. Rob Liefeld is no longer an image, and probably issue sixty four. That might be when Sylvester comes right back. Yes. So, uh, and, you know, and, and the bigger backdrop of comics as a whole at this time is plummet, plummeting sales, real bad. distributors going away. Yeah. All of that, you know, Liefeld's heyday at this point is all that speculator boom has contracted, and now it's almost like, oh boy, comics are over. Right. Which is going to be the narrative for the next couple of years from that kind of like, we were selling millions and now we're selling 30,000 or less. Totally. So it's, it's the sky is falling and maybe the biggest fall is Rob Liefeld in this time period. And there is a, uh, there is a Todd McFarlane rebuttal piece that is uh, at the end of this. This issue takes place uh, April of 1997. So uh, it's a little bit past our wizard coverage, and you know what, man? There is a lot of legalese, and and there's a there's a this is this is a you know 1997 Rob Liefeld. This is a 1997 Todd McFarlane. Fences were were mended to some extent over the years. Don't want to like rankle up old old uh, wounds, but also it might not be the greatest idea to put our own conjectures in in our own prognostications and our own thoughts uh, into like what we're reading. I was thinking like. Yeah, we read this interview. Let's just kind of do a, a, a sort of recap of, of, of stuff. But I think maybe, I think maybe we go to the other part of the studio and we just do a read along. How do you? What do you think about that, Jimmy? Probably the the safest thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in this little exercise, it's been a while since we did a courtroom drama, Jimmy. Uh, I'll be playing Hart D. Fisher, the Dark Prince of Outlaw Comics, the publisher of Boneyard Press, the man who uh, who published Kill Image with 
bl- knives through Rob Liefeld's head, or like, you know, weird whites to the eyes. I forget. They all blur to me, man. But I feel like severed heads are involved. And definitely within the context of the comic, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, they uh, they meet uh, terrible, terrible ends. And you could play Rob Liefeld. All right. And we'll jump right into things. Once again, this is uh, issue 195 of Comics Journal. Tom Toll's on the cover. And this was sent to us by West Coast Dave v- Vengers, who has a uh, comic business where he where he, he fulfills orders of like very interesting comics. But he's also got a YouTube channel, uh, interview guys like Japan Book Hunter, and most recently uh, Todd McFarlane. That's right. Hopped through, man. So big shouts to uh, West Coast Dave, big supporter of the Kayfabe channel from pretty much day one. And if you're good to go, I'm good to go, Jimmy. Did you do the date? Did you say the date? Uh, it will be. I think we did in the in the earlier part, but it's uh, it's April of nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, and we should say everything that's happened is Life Out leaves Image in fall of ninety six. There is a lawsuit that has been settled by the time of this interview. Yes, yes. B- and between Rob Life Out and the Image, I guess people that are remaining at Image. We were gonna maybe just uh, do do a review of this, but uh, let's let let the the words of the men uh, speak for themselves. Hart D. Fisher jumps on board are you ready for the lynching yes how old are you rob i'm 28 and how long have you been doing comics i think this year will be 11 years do do you feel like you've really really accomplished a lot of good stuff well i feel like i've had a fun ride what do you feel is your greatest moment hmm the stuff that i like the most just in terms of the work i did i did about five issues of young blood i thought were decent the first miniseries was a disaster then i came back and did it and caught the It had the voice that I wanted it to have the second time. It was more of a take on how these people kind of cope with being these kind of celebrity superheroes. The characters of Shaft and Bad Rock, it was like Youngblood 6 through 10 or 11. Those issues, I liked the way, to me, I just wanted to put together a good action adventure with character arcs. And the characters of Shaft and Bad Rock, I approach them as different, Shaft and Bad Rock. I approach them as different parts of myself. There are parts of me that I put into Shaft and there are parts of me that I put into Bad Rock. So these characters are the easiest ones to have a grip on. Bad Rock and his experiences in Hollywood are completely mimicked after my experiences. I gave him my attorney and my manager, and it was really easy to come by. And brace yourself to laugh, but I really dig the stuff we've done with Captain America over the last six issues. Ha, 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 ha. Sorry, I can't help it. I had a blast on that stuff. You ever worry about getting shot by some crazy Captain America fan? You know what? I don't worry about that stuff. They seem to be, from what I hear, they seem to be hostile on the internet or whatever. I think that's where they get their frustrations out. That's interesting because it's a very early internet stuff. And I feel like Rob was like the first major like internet like victim of forums and all that kind of thing. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is like the worst period for you in comics? The first issue of Youngblood. I wasn't aware, I was completely just not aware of the importance that book would hold in the scheme of things. It should have been a lot better than it was, and it could have been, and I think I was just thoroughly distracted and caught up in the hype and caught up in, I was kind of confused. I had never started my own business and hiring people. I let the deadline creep up on me, and then it got the best of me, and I didn't perform well, and as a result, it's an awful piece. I look back, and all I see, and I think that's all there is to see, is all the mistakes. And I remember the book had sold well, but a lot of people, when I say sold well, it moved into a lot of people's hands. And I think they wanted it to be a lot better. That was one of your best-selling titles then? Yeah, after X-Force. It sold a million copies. That thing sold that many copies, and that's the one where you're just going, ow, that's funny. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? It's worth noting here. There's so much stuff I want to talk about as we go through this. So pause interview. This is is talking. X-Force sold... Five million. Yeah. It was polybagged with five different trading cards, so some variant there. That's bike sales. Youngblood sold a million and there were no like incentive variants or anything like that. Yeah, it's a legitimate it kind of is, and it's almost on par with those X Force numbers. It's very close. You're right. But if you think that, you know, you're selling inflated numbers there. And what luck, huh? Like the thing that you're like not proud of at all is like uh the most voluminous uh comic out there. You know, the other part of that is that when Youngblood comes out, it is like X-Force, 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 Youngblood. Right. It's not like there's a year between them where it's like, hey, we're starting a new company. I need to assemble a team to color this and to plan on 20 new characters. It's really wild in hindsight how truncated that time is. And I'd say the same thing with like Jim Lee and Wildcats and X-Men. McFarlane's off a little bit. You know, he had left Spider-Man 
But these other two, it is almost like, I don't know if there's a break. There are ads for Youngblood in X-Force comics that Rob Liefeld has art in. And uh, same thing with Jim Lee. It's the last, because they did 12 issues or so, 11 issues of X-Men, maybe 12. But in those last Art T-Bear issues of X-Men, you, there are Wildcats ads. Same thing with Youngblood. And I say that mostly because I think we, it's a very different time now. You finish a book now and it's a year approximately for the publisher to then bring that book to market, which is sales and, you know, final prep and get everything right. It wasn't that way at this time. Right. So that's, that's all I'm pointing out there. Cause I look back on it and I think that is chaos. What these guys are doing. a lot of stuff doing. going down for sure. Yeah. All right. So back to the interview and uh, back to Rob life out here. This video is brought to you by the comics that we make. Ed Piscor's Switchblade Shorties is now available daily on all of our social media and all of Ed's social media. You can follow that wherever you want to read your comics. Red Room Crypto Killers, the latest and third volume in the Red Room trilogy is now available. However, you can start at any of these books because they are all self-contained. Hip Hop Family Tree, the omnibus, collecting all four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree plus 150 extra pages. Now available wherever you buy books and X-Men Grand Design, the trilogy trade paperback, kind of the mass market version of X-Men Grand Design, collecting all three volumes in one volume. Hulk Grand Design, out of print on the treasury size edition, coming soon as a trade paperback. Pre-order that one now. Street Angel Princess of Poverty and Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive. Collect all of my Street Angel comics in two handsome volumes. You can get those wherever books are bought and sold. And my self-publishing efforts, True Crime Funnies, BW Zine, and 1986 Zine are all available on jimrug.com or patreon.com slash jimrug. And now back to our video. It should have been better. I think that marked a pretty bad period for me. It seemed like my career was going in a positive direction, and then I completely derailed at that point. How did you derail? I've been told by several people that you're a pretty straight arrow. You don't drink. You don't do any uh, drug abuse or any of that stuff. How would a straight air arrow derail? Uh, what, I, what I mean derail, I think in terms of the work. I became way too, uh, what's the word, self? Self-indulgent? Yeah, that's it. Self-indulgent. I thought that I could just create 20 characters and put them on a page and that would be interesting. And I got away from what I think what got me noticed in the first place. When I did my run on New Mutants, I was able to come in and introduce a lot of new ch characters, but it was the relationships that those characters had that excited the fans and got them to pick up the book. I think when Image first came out, it was like, wow, I don't have an editor. I can just go off on my own. And I think it all came about, wow, I can really do 20 pages of just a big fight scene. You need someone to ground you. Yeah, I absolutely needed someone to go, hey, this sucks, this is terrible, this makes no sense. And like I said, it exists, it's out there, it's awful. Ha ha ha. And I wish I could take it back, but I can't. You gotta live with it. You go, wow, that was a pretty big blunder on a pretty big scale. And when I say derail, I mean it's like I caught so much flack for that. And I honestly don't believe I've ever recovered. No matter how many steps I believe I take in the right direction, just for myself. In terms of, like I said, the other Youngblood stuff is far superior, but... I've been told that young blood is tainted. Comics for kids. Are you shooting for a specific audience with your stuff? Do you feel like you're writing just for kids? You know, honestly, yeah, Hart. And that's why I think I've heard people say, why don't you do more adult stuff? But I've had this conversation with a lot of different freelancers or just comic book people over time. I think I'm not interested at this point in my career. It's just not where my head's at in catering to an audience of probably... Maybe I'll even say 18 and above. I do comics for kids. And at this point, I'm at least honest enough to say I don't have a great adult piece of work in me. And I think that the great comics appeal to all ages. I've heard that said. You're making a big deal right now uh, that you're taking the violence out and you're trying to get back to more of a Christian foundation with your books. Oh, I didn't say Christian foundation. <laughs> uh, well, you mentioned that you came from a background of a lot of preachers in your family. Yeah, my dad is a minister and my grandfather. What denomination are you? They were Baptist. I'm just, I have a belief in God. I have a Christian belief in God, but I don't believe. If you read Evangeline, not that you'd ever read Evangeline. Oh, you'd be surprised at what I've read, Rob. I read everything. That's certainly, I've offended a gazillion Christians. Probably putting an angel with a bustier and leather hot pants. Right. Probably that was part of my upbringing coming out going, you know, let's just go ahead and do this. To me, Evangeline, I just wanted to do stories about this angel. 
And if I could go back, I would put her in less revealing stuff. Are you going to move towards a less revealing costume? No, I mean she will wear less revealing stuff. But there's a lot of really gratuitous shots, and the artist... Lots of camel toes in that book. Yeah. But in the last year, there's been a lot less. The last, I'd say, 12 issues have been much more tame. I think it's kind of ridiculous trying to do something seductive with an angel. She's dressed in baggy sweaters and jeans now, and she doesn't... Now watch, I haven't looked at the last two issues. I'm going to see her in some nighty. But the last issues I'm familiar with, we've gotten away from that. Now when you say Christian, no. Doing Captain America and going back to those Marvel icons, I just remember what I liked when I was a kid. And what I liked as a kid wasn't really risque stuff. And I think there's an audience for risque stuff. I think it absolutely has its place. I think it should be out there. I've done some of it. But for me personally, I just like the superhero stuff right now. And a lot of people say grow up, but that's where my head's at. Having Captain America knock a bunch of AIM guys around or fighting the Red Skull, that to me gives me... Has your family, since they're Baptists, hassled you about the portrayal of an angel like that? You know, they don't care. They don't care? No, I mean, I probably have some relatives that are real uptight about it, but I don't hear from them one way or another. Is your family pretty close? Are you a pretty close-knit family? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My dad's had numerous brain surgeries over the last 10 years, about five surgeries. So he hasn't done anything ministry-wise in a long, long time. He just likes seeing the comic books. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have a sister, older sister. She's involved with helping you run uh, your company? She was. She was. She's doing something else now. She was with us for about four years. We've really downsized the company to reflect what's going on in the industry, and there's no need for... A lot of large overhead when the numbers aren't there in the comics. So we're down to a small staff of maybe five or six people in the studio now. She's gone off and doing something else, but she was with us probably for the better part of five years. The work day. How much time do you put in at the office? Probably 12 hours a day. Do you draw at home or do you draw at the office? I draw at home every morning. I probably draw five hours in the morning and then I go into the office and then I'll draw again in the afternoon evening. But the minute I get into the office, I'm kind of deluged with whatever the bad news of the day is. Uh, yeah, you're having lots of fun right now. It's part of life. You got to take the good with the bad or the bad with the good. Do you feel that the business pulls you away uh, too much from the creative end? I think for a long time it did. In the last nine months, I really did get out of at least as much as I could in terms of the business stuff. I just wanted to draw. You know, drawing Captain America and drawing the Avengers and stuff like that, that's what I was able to pull back a little more, and that's a lot more. I'm happier when I'm just drawing. I literally have no interest in running a business. I did it. It's not for me. It's not fun. Do you feel that you made a lot of mistakes running your business that you wouldn't have happened had you uh, had a good business manager doing it? Yes and no. I mean, I look and I see the positives and I see the negatives, and I'd say there's probably an equal amount of both. I certainly wish I hadn't made the negatives, but I've got a philosophy that I live by, which is learn from your mistakes. I've generally, I made a list of all the mistakes I've made multiple times. I try not to make the same mistakes over and over, but I feel like the last five years have been a tremendous learning experience. I've learned about the comics business that I have had, that I had no idea how the business was run pre-image comics. And now I understand the business more. I think the biggest mistake of the last two years was probably believing that the comics industry was going to turn a corner and planning and hoping for that. I learned to pay more attention to numbers. So do you think that the comic book industry is just spiraling down? Uh, it isn't going to rebound anytime soon? I don't know. I hear all the theories. I hear from people who are older and wiser than I am. I listen and I look. I talk to the comics retailer locally in the area. And I take in kind of all the information that's given to me. Obviously, right now, the industry is struggling. It's harder for everybody to do what they love because the profits really aren't there. I think it's a challenging period. I know some real doomsayers. I don't know if I'm there yet. I have a rosy outlook. Are you pretty pissed off from getting fired from Marvel? No, I expected it. Look, two guys hired Jim and I, a guy named Jerry Calabrese and Joe King. And we developed a really good relationship with those guys. And over the course of the year and a half, you know, we probably negotiated the deal for a better part of a year. They flew out to LA almost once a month and we'd go and meet them in New York. And the idea of working together kept changing. Originally, it was maybe some crossovers. Then there was the idea that maybe they would license the books as a co-venture. And then it became what it became, which was two books each with Jim and I. And I think Jim and I, again, an opportunity to work on characters that I never worked on before when I was with the company. 
and characters that actually got me into comics. Jerry and Joe left the company. They weren't fired. Joe left and went to work someplace else, and Jerry just disappeared. Whether he was fired or not, no one will ever confirm. He left way before. He left before the book shipped. Joe left like when the third issues were coming out and a new regime came into Marvel. Marvel editorial hated the stuff we were doing, and Joe would tell me that I was seen by the editorial staff as the weaker of the two in terms of that they could push me around. I saw that for myself. He just confirmed what I believed. And when he was gone, I remember I was in New York for a convention in October, and I was in the editorial offices, and a couple of the editors smiled at me and said, Joe and Jerry are both gone now. And I thought, oh shit, my number is up. I was really surprised we lasted as long as we did. Like I said, I got the letter in January, and they cited low sales as a reason for my termination. And it came like two weeks after the president of the company had called me right when they filed bankruptcy and said, everything's going to stay the same. Nothing's going to change. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't believe this at all. And so the letter came and they said they wanted to renegotiate. And it was clear they didn't. And I felt like I honestly, I wanted to draw my sixth issue, the six issues that I committed to personally drawing. And I got to do a couple cool issues of Avengers. So I was like, Working with Marvel after Joe and Jerry left became really miserable. Just a completely miserable experience. I was focusing on, regardless of what you said, and we can talk about that, the critical lambasting we took. The books were selling really well. And the key to that is that they were selling to kids. And of all the retailers I've talked to, and at one point we had 50 or so retailers that had written for us into Marvel, we had kind of a sheet telling them how the books were doing. And some of them were saying, to their shock, they were doing well. When I went out last year on the road to answer your question about the critics or the fans who have not liked the stuff, I kind of knew that going into it. I remember when John Byrne took over Superman, all the crap he took. The poster child, Fisher says. Uh, you catch a lot of flack uh, for your different weaknesses and anatomy and such. Is there ever a point where you go, wow, shit, maybe that panel did stink? Well, yeah, Hart, absolutely. I honestly believe that you compare the stuff that I drew today to the stuff I drew five years ago, you'll see growth. You may not like the stuff, but you'll see that there's growth and there's learning. Sure, I took some of the stuff that I do and I go, wow, that was really terrible. I thought that a lot of your earlier work, like on Hawk and Dove, showed real promise. Uh, I think as you've gotten more powerful over editorial, you've gotten a little sloppier. Yeah, you know, they reprinted the New Mutant stuff that I did. And when I look at it, I just think it's awful. And when I look at, like I said, at the Captain America stuff, there's some stuff where I go, man, I really don't like the way I drew that face or whatever. Do you ever draw outside of comics? I could probably blow your mind by going and grabbing 200 life drawing sheets that I could show you. I've taken life drawing. I can draw a human figure. If you want to come over sometime. Is it the rush of the deadline then? No, it's a style. I like to draw whatever, weird ankles and wrists. And I grant that there's a segment in the fans that don't care for it. Take a really stylized guy like, is it Bruce Tim, the guy who does the Batman animated style? That's style, and it's style that people like, and I just draw in a style that has a split audience. Are you pa Pause here. Yes, sir. I, I think a lot about this style thing, because yeah. I struggle to have a what I think of as a clearly defined style. This idea that the style of Rob Liefeld splits the audience, I am convinced that split is commercially viable. I and think that it's, it's the most important more thing. More viable than if you have... Everybody likes it. Absolutely. It's like everybody could like it and it's and it's uh placid. It's it's a C average in your on your high school term paper. If you I, if you I'm, I'm people... saying regardless of the quality, like it could be A plus, but if everybody likes it, I don't think it sells as well as if there is a split. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like the people it's it's the same as like do like doing this shit publicly. Like you could position yourself in a place where everybody likes you and uh they internalize it, it's cool, they forget about it when we actually state a fucking opinion that is polarizing it's the haters who are going on reddit letting people know that cartoonist kayfabe exists so you're able if you don't see negative feedback then you're not reaching new people you know like if, if you legitimately don't like something you're not going to fuck with it but when you get this like new reinforced feedback of like people who don't like it it's either they're part of the hive mind and they're completely ignorant or they did happen upon it, which all that matters is we sell it. Like the great Easy e shit when people were buying NWA records and, and burning them and, and, and putting them on fire. They didn't 
it wasn't larceny. It's they, it's they Howard bought the Stern, shit. right? People that like it listen for forty five minutes, and the people that hate it listen for ninety. And and we can bill uh, accordingly. So thank you guys for your ad rev and all that good stuff, man. Good to go. Yep. Uh, are, are we at poster child? Oh no. Um, are you ever worried? Uh, like with John Byrne, he was very very popular uh, when I was into John Byrne. But then as I grew up, I no longer I'm no longer into John. Are you ever worried that the style is going to become outdated and you're going to end up like John Byrne or Kirby? Again, I could comment on all of this stuff. <laughs> uh, this is another interjection on my part. The Kirby thing, I think, is interesting because there are stories of how he was treated at Marvel when he goes back in the 70s that are awful stories. Jack the Hack, they called him. Yes. And, you know, the previous column of, of Rob Liefeld talking about his experience at Marvel, it made me think of that before I even got to this point. Right. All right, I'm back into the interview, back to Liefeld. Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah, and even as recently as this morning. I'm sitting around this morning and trying to think about how to do something more interesting because I get bored as well. Like I said, face-to-face, -face, we could just walk through a book and you can point to something and go, I think this is terrible. And I'll go, okay, that doesn't bother me. And five panels later, you'll go, I think this is terrible. And I'll go, yeah, I agree with you. There are certain things I'm going to agree with and I'm going to disagree with. I got to be honest with you, Hart. I never understood the hoopla and the anger. And I believe that I, that had I had no success, that no one would talk about it. I absolutely agree with that yep. for sure, man, because that would be punching downward. Like if there's a lot of jealousy that somebody of X quality is doing financially better than you as you, through your perception and that uh, rankled a lot of feathers. Fisher, uh, it seems... Like, you're really an easy target when it comes to people who want to bitch about the drawing in comics. Yeah, I'm the poster child. You become quite the butt of the industry. You take a lot of heat for yourself. For fish are just piling on. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, look, when I took the Captain America assignment, I was reading the Wade Garney stuff, and I was enjoying it. But I also realized, and it was confirmed later, that, you know, that stuff wasn't selling more than 40000 an issue. Now, I'm not comparing my dick to their dick. What I'm telling you is the Pause. Captain America should sell more copies. That's what I felt like. Now, how much of that do you feel is attributed to the car wreck factor where people slow down to see how bad they think it's going to be? I think a car wreck lasts an issue or two, but it doesn't run for six issues and it doesn't give the kind of consistent performance we had. I was telling you that last year I went out on the road to promote the stuff. I hadn't done that kind of convention grind in a long time. I went to Detroit, to Pittsburgh, Oakland, Dallas, San Diego, to New York, and I would meet a lot. We had we had posters of stuff, and kids kids came up to me, 8, 10, 12, 14, and they came up and they were like, they grabbed a poster and they would say to either myself or someone behind the table, wow, I never picked up Captain America before I'm going to give this a shot. And you know, that's more important to me. I've had people say that now Captain America has been exposed to a greater audience base than it has in years. Even in the recent issue of CBG, Comics Buyer's Guide, at least they were kind enough to note that we experienced the highest sales on Cap that Captain America has had in four or five years. And again, the train wreck thing, I understand there are people who believe that, but the numbers just don't back it up. There was a consistent audience base for those books and they were growing, and the retailers, even the guys who couldn't stand me, I'd go into stores and they'd go, I hate your work, but I gotta be honest, I'm selling triple the number of Captain Americas. And you know what? I think the kids weren't buying the Fantastic Four, and weren't buying Iron Man, weren't buying Cap, and they weren't buying the Avengers, and we made them cool again. I think the problem, one of the problems is I see it from my vantage point, if we're all sitting in a circle and all looking at the industry, I think the industry is pushing towards making comic books for the 40 and 30 year old set. The older crowd wants their comics done the way they want kind of an old school approach and they're not accepting of something new and daring. And I've read the response to all the Heroes Reborn books. There's not an awful lot of positives that anyone has to say. Maybe Jim has 15% more positive reviews than I do or I did. I read the online postings and I read the stuff and it's like, we're missing the kids, man, and that's a problem. Do you feel like a certain degree of your appeal to the kids is your drawing ability and your drawing style is more accessible to them? Uh, they feel like they're much more able to imitate it? I've heard that. I don't buy that. I find that an absurd theory. I can't tell you whether that's true or not. I can't tell you whether that's true, and I haven't seen any absolute hard evidence. Anything's a possibility. I think that at the end of the day, there are people who have gone, I don't like your work, but it has a lot of energy. That's what they respond to, you know? I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you why people are interested in my work. 
I can't tell you why people hate my work, but I have a very silent fan base that seems to pick up the stuff I do. Conjecture? Our stuff? I am the evidence of Hart's argument. Like, I absolutely thought that, because I was, at the time, I was into copying. Like, that's the first step on the course of drawing shit is copying from the comics. Uh, some of it was by virtue of the fact that there was a full figure on every page. So it was like more bang for my buck. Like, that's sort of how I was buying comics. It was like, is there a lot of full figures that I could copy for myself? And uh, it was easier to copy and draw that stuff. I've showed it off on this channel a lot of times, drawn Feral and uh, Shaft and stuff. Uh, far easier to draw than the Wally Wood, Russ Cochran books that, that, that were coming out. Uh, at that time. You know, another piece that we just read here is Liefeld putting his finger on the, I think the industry is pushing towards making comic books for the 40 and 30 year old set. Yeah. 100% I feel like that's the world we live in today. Right. And it's funny that like, was everybody not aware of that at this point? Right. You know, did it happen accidentally because people weren't conscious of like, we're chasing, you know, whoever's buying whatever mm -hmm. and who that is are 40 year olds. Listen, here's here's one last last piece uh, for for uh, the people to kind of chew on because it's very appropriate for some stuff that's going on lately. But I have a very silent fan base that seems to pick up the stuff I do. They just recently announced Thundercats cover. He did an exclusive variant uh, overnight, pretty much bumped up the numbers, hundred seventy thousand copies based on the Rob Liefeld Thundercats uh, variant cover for for Dynamite. So. They're out there. There's an old uh, Chris Rock joke that he did at the uh, at the VMAs that he hosted way back in the day. He's like, Spice Girls are like crack. They sold 50 million. Nobody's talking about how much they love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we say this, uh, you know, I feel like we say this a lot. The idea like making a good comic does not mean that comic sells. Right. The quality and the sales are two different things. Mm -hmm. So regardless if you, I'm talking to our audience, think that you that Rob Liefeld's art isn't good that's fine it might not be uh that doesn't necessarily have a bearing on how it performs right. you know there's two different things and it's a commercial medium so like there is a bottom line in comics especially in like this kind of work for hire comic and that bottom line is sales and regardless of the quality of the art the sales is a separate category yeah and, and we're going to be getting into a lot of the, this bottom line talk as we uh, move forward. Yes. Back to the interview, Hart Fisher. Do you find the same type of fan base is also picking up the Maximum Press books that picked up the Captain America book? No, I don't. I don't think we're doing those kinds of books. And I also think, I mean, really, kind of on the easiest level, we'll see when I go back. When I go back and do a superhero book for that label, we don't do anything like Captain America or the Avengers there. Youngblood, which would be the closest thing to it, we haven't published in a long time because I didn't want to put an artist... The artist we had drawing the book left the book, fulfilled his commitment, and we didn't have another artist to put on the book, and I'd rather not publish a Youngblood that I think really stinks. We don't do a lot of superhero titles right now. I don't see Glory or Supreme, which I feel would be our two superhero titles in the vein of Cap and Avengers. Is Supreme, with the Alan Moore stuff, doing anywhere near as well as Captain America? It's been growing in sales every month. I think people are enjoying it, and there's definitely a retro fest going on in that book. And Alan, I've spoken to Alan, and by no means, I just want to make totally clear, I'm just telling you what Alan and I have discussed. I'm not linking myself to Alan in this way. Trying to compare myself to Alan Moore is not what I'm doing. Alan is obviously very diversified, with stuff like Watchmen, Swamp Thing, From Hell, Spawn, Supreme, and it seems like the audience up until Supreme, at least the retailers and the people we talk to, they said they don't like Alan's image work. They'd rather see him do more From Hell, more V for Vendetta type stuff. And he came on Supreme, and we were just fortunate that the stuff clicked. It's just a real basic superhero comic that has a lot of flavor from the 60s and 50s, and it seems to be hitting, and people really enjoy it. And we sell out of every issue, and we had to go back to press on the first issue, and I see that as a good sign. I love comics is the subtitle for this section. Fisher says, uh, you catch a lot of flack from uh, people saying a lot of your characters are blatant ripoffs. Like I can make people have made the case that Bad Rock is like the thing. Absolutely. And Kid Supreme is Superboy. Right down to the leather jacket and the smiley button with the sunglasses and the leather band around the, the tie. How do you feel about stuff like that? Are you consciously doing something or are you not? Is Kid Supreme my Superboy? Absolutely. 
We were getting him out of... I don't like that his costume was as close. I was not responsible for that look. I published that look. I regret that. In the future, he's going to look different. But is he my Superboy? Is Supreme my Superman? Hart, all I can tell you, and this is the one thing that just interests me, I grew up reading DC and Marvel Comics, and I remember opening up X-Men and seeing the Legion of Superheroes, and they were called the Imperial Guard. There was Lightning Boy Guy, the Cosmic Boy Guy, and I'm like 10, 11 years old when this is going on. And I go, wow, these are all like the Legion of Superheroes. The Squadron Supreme was completely derivative of the Justice League. And I thought they did it in such a way, you know, with a wink and a nod or whatever, but they never sued each other over it. So if you can't draw Superman, but you really want to do Superman or write a story about Superman and you don't own him, then you kind of create your own. Certainly super, certainly Supreme is my take on Superman. Glory has Wonder Woman-esque elements about it. I don't try to hide that. We don't try to dismiss it. So you don't, you don't feel like you're ripping anybody off. You feel like you're getting your chance to do those characters. Yeah. Look, I feel there are there's a popular icon image. Whether it's Superman or Captain Marvel, I made mine supreme. There was a company in the 80s that had one. I forget what his name is. It was in a book called The Hero Alliance. Jim Lee has a guy who's a Superman character. But you know, like, look, like you said, I seem to take a lot of flack, and that's fine. I accept it. I'm going to sit here. I'm not going to sit here and complain about it. Do you ever sit back and go, quote, well, I'm counting my money all the way to the bank? No. Hey, Hart, I haven't made a whole lot of money in the comics industry the last couple of years. Nobody has. That's it. I'm not taking any of this stuff to the bank. I'll tell you right now, every issue of Supreme for the last seven issues we produced at an absolute loss. But the reason I produce at an absolute loss is I'd rather have a book that people like in the hopes it'll turn around. And people will say that's why Rob is a bad businessman. But you know what? I like those Supreme comics. And if Alan signed on for a certain run of the book, then I'm going to publish that run. And whether we lose five or seven grand an issue, it's the best thing that we publish. I was looking at the numbers from some of the last year and that you were running Extreme through Image and doing some numbers in my head. And it seems that you were losing quite a lot of money. Does that scare you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Very few of the books have remained profitable. And if you are running at a negative like that, how are you supporting yourself now? Have you got extra work? Is it the Hollywood money coming in? Um, it's a little bit of both. Is it t-shirts? Is it under ruse? <laughs> no, it's all that put together. The philosophy of my company is that the comic books are R&D for everything else. It's research and development. We do a miniseries. We'll do, I'll do a story and hopefully it grows our library. And that library has value just as Marvel and DC Comics libraries have value. For instance, I got the numbers for everybody's books the other day, and I looked at the Batman line, and the Batman line does between fifty and 30000 a shot from the highest-selling Batman book, which is like 50000 on the March numbers I've received, to Catwoman and Robin, which do 30000 And you can't tell me that those books are turning a profit. They're not. But the Batman franchise is immensely profitable. The reason I want to do the television and movie deals when they present themselves is because if one of them is successful, it will give the property a life that we can't give it in publishing. I'd rather publish comics than make movies or cartoons. Look at my numbers, and I think they prove my point. I haven't been... Conjecture, like, this is uh, this is the model for the mainstream publishers. I'm it's glad the you say that, because, again, this goes back to when he says the readers are 40 years old. Whenever he says these comic books are R&D for basically the licensing, yes, this is literally 2024... This is comics. Absolutely. You know, and when I say comics, I'm saying comic books. The comic books. Marvel DC. Kind yes. Of shit. And, exactly. and honestly, some of that image stuff, like when you have your little mini series or the writers who are building up super giant bibliographies, it's uh, the library and they just need one of those to hit. That's why I'm always on the side of the artist, man. Get some equity. Get as much as you can because you're just spending time doing this one comic while this writer's out there writing five things. He's going to have something that hits. It isn't a rising tide raises all ships how many tech jacket comics are out there how many that wolfman comic are out there this is 27 years ago i know and i crazy. mean it is literally describing pretty much how the comics industry you know where it's at we're giving you some history and uh, do with that with as as you will man are you doomed to repeat it or are you going to take some uh, ownership fish fisher goes uh, is there a point right now where unless a franchise 
comes in and is successful uh, that you see the writing on the wall and you feel like I've got maybe another year or two of this comic thing and if we don't get a film that bails us out I'm in real trouble no it's not relying on film you'd be surprised at the number of people who contact us who are interested in us you would seek outside investment kind of like Jim Shooter has done yeah I mean we've had people who've already sought us out and there are different things that we consider and I've never been financed I've always been self-financed but whether it's movies or I mean there was a year where I think 50% of our earnings was the licensing off the characters from trading cards uh, toy figures the bendable whatever's that year I really thought we were more like a DC comics or a Marvel comics who who go out who use that stuff to subsidize like I said love me or hate me I love doing comic books and I want to continue doing comic books and it, if eventually I just have to draw a black and white comic book out of my garage, that's what I'll end up doing. I love the medium. But in terms of running, I've had to grow up and run a company that makes money, that posts some profits, and that's what the last year's been about. No regrets. You're at Image, and the company's reasonably successful, and you've got your Extreme Studios, so why did you initially decide to start Maximum Press? I wanted something that I owned 100%. You know, I shared the ownership of Image with the other guys. And there were times when it was really frustrating and I just wanted a company that I could go out and call my own shots and it would either 100% fail or 100% succeed or somewhere in between. And now you guys have got... Uh, <laughs> and now you guys have got a serious blowout here. And with a lot of serious accusations flying back and forth, are you happy you made the Maximum Press move? Oh, absolutely, 100%. I believe the journal has interviewed Todd, and he stated that you've used some of uh, Image's resources to start the company. Todd. I've heard a lot of things Todd has said. He's pretty pissed. Yeah, and I guess he's got a bone to pick. I've heard a lot of the things he said. I wouldn't give them any credence. It's Todd being Todd. Obviously, I crossed the line somewhere. No one has come out and told me where I've crossed that line. I remember there was a point back in September where I go, wow. I honestly wondered what had happened. And of course, I've got my take on everything, but it's water under the bridge to me. The bottom line of what I've read uh, that he said was mostly about money. You build Evangeline stuff on images tab, or you owe money to your printer, or you owe money to your color separators. And there's been liens filed against uh, Extreme by the California Payroll Tax Authority and IRS to the tune of $1.3 million as of last summer. It's on uh, the record at the Orange County uh, rec Recorder of Deeds. My tax situation is out there for anybody. It's a situation we got into, again, that I have to take responsibility for ultimately. It was a situation I wish that had not happened. It's something we dealt with. That's in the past, and we've dealt with it. This is that thing that you hear people talk about when, uh, when cash flow pays for the business. It's like you, eventually you need something to come in because you're, it's good money after bad basically uh is the f is the irs thing taken care of it's absolutely taken care of i mean we wouldn't be around if it wasn't they don't mess around but that was an extreme thing that had nothing to do with image that had to do with the accountant that we hired needless to say we don't use that accountant anymore was that a case of embezzlement it was a case of bad bookkeeping look i had no idea my personal taxes i don't mess with the government you know I have people running my company. I didn't know I had to watch the books as carefully as I watched the comics, and it was a mess. And like I said, it's been dealt with, and if it hadn't been dealt with, we wouldn't be here. The stuff you bring up with Todd losing money, you know, it's just not the case. I could sit here and try and argue it, but it's so... I think that's what... Those ac accusations are out there for me to respond to. That's why they're there, I think, to rile me up. You guys are still in court, right? No. Image and I settled about two months ago. It's just not something we decided to put a, a release out about. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, is that something you can't talk about? You know what? I can talk about it. It's just not very interesting to anybody. There's no non-disclosure. I mean, it's something that can be talked about. You should call Todd. He can tell you all about it. I don't really want to hear Todd. I'm curious as to how you feel about it. We know Todd's pissed as a raving monkey. It's over as far as I'm concerned. It's behind us, and we've moved on. Image and ourselves... Those documents have been filed for two months, and it's in the past. You know, I understand that it's interesting to a lot of people out there, and I assume a lot of it is public record. I assume that it's stuff that you can go and search out, and the other image guys, they're available to talk about it. I'm just glad, I'm just glad that to put it behind me. Do you feel bad? Do you feel like you've lost a lot of friends? 
like with Jim Valentino and people like that? No, no. Some of these guys, no, don't. Hart, you don't want to hear my sad song. Sure I do. I don't want to hear my sad songs. <laughs> I believe in moving on. Look, I think that might makes right. And I've been on that side when I've had the might, and I understand that it can be abused. And I think that image is bigger, and whatever they're going to say is what's right. And there's more of them, and as far as I'm concerned, they can say whatever they like. The guys, I have a lot of, I have a great deal of respect, I'd say, for the majority of them, I do. Todd was always, to me, a ticking time bomb. Hey, pause here one second. This part about, like, you know, I understand it's interesting to a lot of people out there, and, you know, it's public record and everything. I did have the thought reading this of, like, is this any of our business? You know, and, and there's there's some of this info is public and stuff, so it's not that it's whatever to get into it, but it is a strange thing because it does feel really Invasive. personal in a lot of ways. And props to Hart Fisher for, for, for putting the thumb on it and keep it. He's doing the Barbara Walters thing. It, it feels more sensational to me than if you sent like an investigative reporter and like really got to the nuts and bolts of this. You know, like this is sort of the the emotional, the uh, Us Weekly or whatever version of this versus like what actually happened. I mean, it's, we got Hart Fisher. It's not uh, Paul Gravatt or Look, somebody. man, I find it interesting, yeah. but I do, I do see like how this is about as close to tabloid journalism as you're getting with like some of the comic stuff. And there's other stuff in comics that are like that. I oh, think yeah. people gravitate towards it. Uh, but you don't feel a need to put out your side of the story with all the accusations flying around? I don't actually. I think it's really boring and dull. All it would be is it would become this whole conspiracy. You'd have their side and my side. If it was just you and me hanging out at my house, sure, I'd talk about it with you. But this is an interview, and it's on record. The Dixon tapes are rolling. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> it's nothing like that. But I just think, like I said, I don't want to whine. I'm not a whiner. It's over. Was the settlement to your satisfaction? I wouldn't have settled unless I felt that I had something to gain from it. But you didn't feel like you were kind of trapped into it? Oh, no, not at all. No, I wouldn't. Look, of the guys in Image, there were some guys that were going along with the ride who have told me they were forced into the position they were forced into, and that's fine. I understand. Excuse me. It gets back to the whole might makes right. Do you believe in might makes right? No. Of all the people who work for me, look, I don't believe in loyalty. And if you read that sentence, it's like, what does that mean? I believe you should be loyal to yourself. Let me explain how I got to this place. When I was in high school, I worked at a pizza place. It was my job to deliver pizzas. My friend owned the business. He was 22 years old. He was a neighbor of mine. He owned the business. He had given me the job, and it was summertime, and I really didn't want to work. Towards the end of the summer, I wanted to bail out. I wanted to ditch. I wanted to go to the beach and hang out with my friends and do social stuff. And my friend Jeff said to me, look, I know you want to go hang out with your friends, but he said, think about your work and your job and your priorities. Are your friends going to be there to pay your rent? Are your friends going to be there when times get bad? And that really resounded in my head. I think it instilled me with a bit of responsibility. And when people have come to me and said, Rob, I have to move on. I always, especially when it's a better situation, I tell them, look, this is a great opportunity. You should move on. When I say loyalty, a lot of people in the in industry, they tell me, you know, I'm going to finish up with this guy because I want to be loyal to him. And they're getting screwed on their page rate. They're not getting the money that they're owed, whatever. They're getting a $30 page rate when they could be getting a $100 page rate anywhere else. But it's like, oh no, this guy, we got in together. We're going to do this stuff together. I'm going to stay with him. And it's that kind of loyalty. These people instill that in him. You got to be loyal to me. I was there. I was there with you. Conjecture piece. Do you think that that's like sowing the seeds about the uh, Mike Turner, Mark Silvestri stuff where he's poaching ta talent you know that's on the record i feel like that's a, a vague allusion to to that uh issue it could be and it could you know that could apply to everybody because i don't think mike turner's the only guy that rob went to and said here's what i pay right um so it could be i also i think this is mostly right like i mostly agree oh, totally with this. yeah yeah i mean we we have a very popular weekly where uh pu the publisher your publisher is not your friend and a lot of people uh dug that one and i got a lot of emails and calls from from dudes who were like thank you so much for putting that idea out there yeah all right back to it yeah let's take danny mickey for instance i just want to pick him out of the blue he's a guy i met at the comic store when young blood number one came out 
and he was making like $30 a page. No, I'm sorry, he was making $10 a page, he said, from being an assistant inker, filling in the blacks and doing backgrounds. And I really liked his work. He showed me his work and I said, well, come work for me. And the next thing, I was paying Danny like $30,000 a job at Image Comics. The money, the sales were huge and I can afford to be generous. And Danny was, it was his first work as a full-time inker, but that rate, it's not like he established that rate by being in the industry and building up to that rate. I was just, I was able to afford to give him that. So he worked for me and we worked together for the next three years. And then I was interested in being inked by other people and I kept Danny on at the same rate. He didn't ink me anymore. He inked other stuff at the studio. At a certain time and place, he came to me and had a heart to heart and said he wanted to move on. And I said, I understand there's a lot of opportunities out there for you. I certainly didn't browbeat him and say, I paid you thousands of dollars. You should stay with me through thick and thin. I don't believe in that. I think you've got to think about your family and your kids and your livelihood. And that's what I mean in terms of the whole loyalty thing. I just believe that I don't remember how we got on this. I was asking you how you felt about how these guys have been your friends for so long and now money and everything and the business. And how, how do you feel about losing these friendships? Okay, I just think that I made a decision. I wanted out of the company. When I mentioned Jim Valentino's name, you chuckled quite heartily. I did. He's a funny guy. But when it came down to, I looked at the deal we had with Image Comics, and it really only benefits you if you're selling a lot of numbers. And the majority of books at Image were not selling a lot of numbers. And I looked at my business. Image or Extreme or? No, Image. Image Comics. I'm saying Image, all of us. This is last July. And I look at the numbers, and I mean, we would always cry when the numbers came in. They were terrible. There were no positive signs anywhere. And the way the deal was structured at Maximum Press, I actually made more money off of the lower selling books. And in terms of more money, I mean pulling a few cents more profit, which would enable us to stay in business and to be able to do more projects, go work with a guy like Alan Moore or whatever. And I wanted to pull some of my books and put them into Maximum. And it was something that I called up and talked to the distributors about. And they said, whether your books are with Image or whether they're with Extreme or Maximum, we don't really care, fine. It was something that I definitely felt I had to do. And it comes down to the discount structure. At Image, the retailers are given a greater discount structure based on our deal that we made. What we didn't think through is that discount structures only benefit us if the books are selling at a high, really high volume. None of my books were selling at a really high volume. I mean, at what Spawn or Gen 13 were selling. And at Maximum Press, the reason that Image wanted that discount was to stay competitive with DC Comics. They wanted to be able to say, we give the same discount to the retailer. Did you feel that DC was your main competition, not Marvel? I didn't. Look, at Image, I didn't cut the deals. For me to tell you I cut the deals, I barely understood half the deals. Jim and Todd cut most of the deals, and they were the guys who were out there cutting like 100% of the deals, and we'd hear about it at the meetings. Mark, Eric, myself, and Jim. We'd ask questions, we'd voice our concerns, but those guys, Jim would run the numbers, and he would take it on himself and give it to Larry, and that's how it came down. And it was just voiced so strongly by Todd that we needed to be competitive with DC for the retailers. And at a maximum and at maximum press, the retailer doesn't get as good a discount, so I can get more money. And again, no one's getting rich off comics. But it's so we can keep producing comics and pull an extra couple of thousand from each book. And that was my when I presented this to the image guys, they said, Oh no. And from there it got very hostile. And I didn't expect it to go the way it did, but it seemed like everyone has told me. My mom said, I hear this Todd McFarlane guy really has it in for you. That's what everyone said. Todd really had it in for me. I feel Todd always called me his little buddy. He called me the little brother, and I think I was always forever cast in that role. And I think that, oh, shoot, I lost my page. And I think that Big Brother wants to show Little Brother who's right, period. End of story. Shove it down his throat. And that is how I felt, and that's fine. I just don't subscribe to that. And he can tell you all the stories he wants, embezzlement and all that stuff. I think he really wanted to make that story come true. But at the end of the day, the accountants and the lawyer said, there's no way you can say that. That's just a complete fallacy. But he can go and he can put it in the fan press and the fan press will run it. And ultimately it damages me, which is what it is supposed to do. So you feel the allegations have damaged you? It's all business and I'm not with Image anymore. I'm the competition. 
although I'll be the first to admit I'm not very competitive with them. Maximum Press in no way threatens Image Comics in no way, shape, or form. Do you feel that moving extreme to maximum has hurt your sales? Well, given the image debacle, absolutely. I would love to have been able to work out amicably. Who knows? I think the biggest thing that hurts my sales, honestly, is I haven't been doing anything at my own company for two years. I've been building equity in Marvel Comics, but that was a choice I made, and it was a project I really wanted to do. Do you regret doing the Marvel project now? Oh, God, no. I mean, I had a blast doing those books. Like I said, the relationship with the business people at Marvel was miserable, but I sit down and draw a page of Captain America, or I get to draw Red Skull or Baron Zemo, and all that stuff slipped away, and I was just having a good time. But do you think it was a bad business decision not focusing your efforts on your own business? No. I knew going into that my business would suffer, but the agreements with Marvel had terms. It had a year term, and that's one of the reasons I didn't really care about renegotiating with Marvel when they terminated me. I just said, you know, it's time for me to go back and put more of my own efforts toward my company. So I knew that my company would suffer, but I had no great plans. When Captain America came along, I had no new... I didn't know what to do next. Suddenly, this childhood character, this icon I loved when I was a kid presented itself. I jumped at the chance and totally had absolutely no regrets. But I can be honest and say there are ramifications that I knew I would deal with, and now I'm dealing with them. And yeah, there are people who say that's a screwed up way of looking at your business. But the money that we were paid by Marvel Comics, I invested into the company. I invested it into Extreme. There are a lot of people who early on to this day say that Marvel Comics paid for the creation of Image Comics. So Marvel Comics paid to fund my company, and I assume that you'd find Jim did the same thing with Wildstorm. So the cash with Marvel definitely helped out with keeping Maximum afloat. Not afloat. Look, Maximum is not going away right now, and there's no... Marvel's been dried up for a good month and a half in terms of any revenue. Maximum can sustain itself, but was it able to go out and do some different things? Certainly. It all went into the pot, and we divvied it up in terms of the pot. But one of the foolish things I've done... I've put everything I had, I sunk everything I had into the company because I believe in the company and I believe in the library of characters. I want to be publishing comics for 50 years, but, you know, who knows? We are about the halfway point with this uh, with this particular uh, interview, and we're going to start to get into some, some number stuff. We're going to get deeper into uh, the, the legal discussion, uh, but I think we put a pin in it for, for this episode and uh, present the back half tomorrow. Sounds good. Okay, Fabers, we're on the road to 100,000 subscribers. Thank you very much. Make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel, hit like, uh, go play around with the bell, get that setting uh, adjusted so that you get access to all of our videos as soon as we make them live to Gem Pop. Uh, the videos are brought to you by a number of things. A part of that is the Patreon. The King K Fabers on the Patreon get access to all of our videos before anybody else. Uh, a good number of them are hanging out with us in the live stream uh, recording session that we are streaming uh, privately. And that gets you even earlier access to the stuff that we're talking about. Ultimately, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. You don't support the books. We can't make the vids, man. Uh, Jimmy, let the people know what you have on the stands and forthcoming. I have Hulk Grand Design coming out as a trade paperback in May. You can pre-order that one now wherever you pre-order comics, and I appreciate those pre-orders. Let Marvel know that it is worth their while to, uh, to keep these books in print. I also have Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Alive, and Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. Both are out and available now. These collect all of my Street Angel comics. There is a color volume of Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Alive, and a black and white volume in Princess of Poverty. So pick your poison. They are both self-contained. Start reading at either spot. And my self-published efforts, BW Zine, 1986 Zine, and True Crime Funnies are available on JimRug.com or on Patreon.com slash JimRug. Switchblade Shorties is my latest comics effort, uh, putting the strips out daily on all of my uh, social media platforms and the cartoonist kayfabe stuff. So it's on my Instagram. There's a dedicated Switchblade Shorties Instagram. There's a Switchblade Shorties webtoon archive of all the strips where you can read them uh, pretty easily. Uh, there's also a Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor, where you can read uh, way ahead. I have more than 100 strips up there on the Patreon as we speak. Red Room Crypto Killers comes out in uh, at the end of February. 
Uh, this is the last volume of uh, Red Room for the foreseeable future. It contains four self-contained -con stories, so if this is the first Red Room that you are exposed to, you can grab it without uh, the need of the other trade paperbacks. If you dig it, grab the others. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is out there. I saw I saw it online for as low as, as 48 bucks on, on Amazon, so get it while supplies last. Uh, this is a sort of like last run of uh, that first printing before we go to reprints, so uh, not sure quite how many of those are left uh, right now, but it's the best book I've made to date. And X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback. Uh, this is the collection of all of my X-Men Grand Design works, probably three years of work went into uh, this package. Some of those are out of print, so this is your way to get uh, access to all of those comics at once. Uh, Jimmy, there are a couple of other ways that the people can directly support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Will you let those people know? You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. A bunch of different ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give the people their marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more.